This letter was sent from Bolivar Jackson Howe to his Aunt Celia Babbitt. Philadelphia, June 10th, 1866. Mrs. Celia Mitchell, West Screen, Erie County, Pennsylvania. Dear Aunt, your very kind and welcome letter of the third inst was received yesterday. I have changed my boarding place since uncle was here. Am boarding now in Chestnut Street, nearly opposite the post office. But yesterday morning I happened in where I used to board and learned that the carrier on that route had a letter for me the day previous. I inquired at the general delivery department, and there I was referred to the carrier room. I inquired there, and after considerable search, the letter was found. But the clerk would not let me see it. He inquired from what part of the country I received or expected letters. I told him it might be from Massachusetts, from Delaware, from North Jersey, or from the western part of the state. He said it might be for me, but he would take it to the chief clerk and I must go round to his office in the other side of the building. I went to him, told him who I was, where I board now, when I left number 18 north of the street, showed him my name stamped on my pocket handkerchief, and underwent another cross-examination as to whom I expected letters from, answering as before. He asked me whereabouts in the western parts of Pennsylvania. I told him Erie County. Where in Erie County? West Green. From whom in West Green? I said I had an aunt there named Celia Mitchell. Then he opened the letter, and the first thing that met his eye was your name. He gave it to me at once, remarking that there could not be any mistake. It was the hardest pursuit after a letter that I have ever undertook, but I came out all okay. Every step and every answer of mine led closer to the point, and I felt richly repaid when I got the letter. I am glad to receive letters from any of your family, particularly so from yourself, and I prize them the more knowing the difficulties under which they are written. I do not wonder that everything seems sad and gloomy to you since the loss of your two dear sons, and yet I would ask you to let the recollection of their noble and patriotic service irradiate that gloom and lighten your mind of a portion of its burden. I often think of them, and my admiration of them is always heightened when I remember the noble cause for which they contended. There were never truer words spoken or written than those of Byron. They never fail who die in a great cause. They may seem to fail, to our limited vision and imperfect reason, their efforts may seem lost, their sacrifices may seem to have been made in vain, but beyond our little span of time, the record of their deeds will live and in remote ages will exert an influence upon the destinies of men. To use the same poet's words again, though years elapse and others share as dark a doom, these but augment the deep and sweeping thoughts that overpower all others and conduct the world at last to freedom. But some will say, what matters it to me? What will it benefit me when I am gone? Why should I labor and toil, endure privations, and make sacrifices if I can reap none of the benefits? I answer, if this life was all, it matters nothing. To make such sacrifices would be foolish, and a thoroughly selfish policy would be the highest style of wisdom. But happily, such are not the teachings that we have received. We feel that our lives are in sympathy with our fellow men, that our interest in our welfare are bound up with theirs, 
and that not upon our professions merely, but upon our manner of life, upon the faithfulness with which we have discharged life's duties and performed our Maker's will, must depend our happiness here and hereafter. I am sorry to hear that your health is so poor. I do not doubt for a moment that your ill health renders your other affliction much harder to bear. My own health is pretty good at present. I have been able to attend to my work all the time, excepting a while last winter. I have a very good boarding place, have been here about four weeks, and think it probable I shall remain here during the summer. But I pay a pretty high price, and if I can get an agreeable place at a less price, though it may be farther from the store, I shall try to do so in the fall. I had a letter from Fenelon since I wrote you last. He is in Smithville, Placer County, California. He is farming, but from what I can learn, he is not making much money. His health is good. He is not married. I have had letters also from Holmes and Henry. Holmes wrote that his health was very good for him, much better than usual. Henry does not enjoy very good health. He suffers from bilious affections and occasionally from scythus. His family are all well. I am pleased to learn that there is a prospect of that photographs being forthcoming soon. Miss Flory wrote me, about a year ago, I should think, that she was going to send me one soon, that in fact she was only waiting to grow good-looking, and then I should have one. I begin to think that it took her a good while to grow good-looking, or else that she had distributed all the copies among her beaux, the young gentleman in western Pennsylvania. But I am glad that there is a prospect of my getting one yet. Well, Aunt C., you cannot say that I have not written you a long letter, even if it has not been a good one. And I have been to church and heard a good sermon besides. Give my love to Uncle and the girls, and write often as you can. I am always glad to hear from you. Yours, B. J. Howe, Direct Box 2130, Philadelphia Post Office.